Hello, um, so my name is Rosa Lavelle Hill. Uh, this is submission number 88, using machine learning methods to better understand the complexities of modern day slavery. So this is from uh, the Alan Turing Institute with myself and Angie Mazunda, um, and also our colleagues um, from Nottingham, James Golding and Gavin Smith. So as many of you will be aware, um, unfortunately, slavery is still with us today. Um, this is despite um, the abolition in the 19th century. Um, so today, instead, rather than it being legal, um, of course, it's more form and has actually become more hidden and harder to detect and measure. Um, so the slavery that, um, term that we use today kind of constitutes any situation of exploitation that a person cannot refuse or leave. And there's normally also some sort of coercion, threat, deception, um, or abuse of power in order to um, have control of these people. And the slavery practices can involve forced labor, um, forced marriage actually, um, which has cut some controversy in some countries who believe that actually it shouldn't be um, part of the slavery definition. Sexual exploitation, which can involve um, sex workers who are controlled by a pimp. Uh, of course, the sort of traditional, what you think of as slavery is bonded labor, and also the trafficking, so the actual moving of human beings illegally from place to place. So the UN Sustainable Development Goal, um, number 8.7, is to end modern day slavery by 2030. So the most recent estimate in 2018 by the GSI was that there's 40 million uh, people, so that's men, women and children, enslaved across the world. And this is occurring in every single country. So roughly one in four of them or 10 million are thought to be children. So in order to achieve this goal by 2030, it's going to involve or estimated to involve freeing about a thousand, uh, sorry, 9,000 slaves a day, which is quite a task. So in order to be able to achieve this, if it's going to be at all achievable, um, given the scale of it, is to better understand the factors which are driving uh, modern day slavery. So this is particularly important at a national level, because as you all know, countries who are looking to achieve these sustainable development goals, um, it's on a country by country basis and countries are actually ranked um, on how well they're doing this. So in the literature, case reports, interviews, um, case studies, um, there are some factors which have already been identified to be key driving forces. Um, so these include poverty, armed conflict, poor literacy, so the displacement of people, so um, whether that be after a natural disaster or indeed a armed conflict, um, and the particular people that are vulnerable to Monday slavery include um, migrants, um, orphans, and people who are homeless. So anyone who's particularly vulnerable in society. But the problem with the research in general at the moment is that it's mostly from these case reports and interviews, which are harder to generalize beyond their um, initial context. So it's hard to generalize, for example, from sexual exploitation to forced labor. It's harder to generalize from one country like the UK to perhaps India. Um, and so really trying to actually study statistically um, the driving forces of um, modern day slavery is a real challenge. So the drivers really haven't been properly statistically or comparatively um, studied. So we don't really know which drivers are more important, whether poverty is more important than armed conflict, for example, or vice versa. And we also don't really know how they interact with each other. So obviously in the real world, you can't isolate um, armed conflict because that has lots of knock-on effects um, to other variables. So these really should be studied together. But of course, then you get issues with multicollinearity um, and traditional sort of regression approaches have uh, really sort of struggled to try and, and capture the complexities which are going on uh, in such a complex social problem. So this is where um, we're sort of proposing that these non-parametric machine learning methods, which are becoming more and more prevalent in the sort of social political sciences, can come in and actually uh, maybe try and 
unravel uh, these driving factors in all their complexities. So this is because they have certain advantages which can help overcome the issues um, of this sort of what I'm going to call small n large p data. So where there is a small number of data points because the data points are countries, um, but a large number of potential possible predictors that we want to study. So as I mentioned previously, just traditional sort of linear regression models have been used um, to study the predictors of um, modern day slavery. But in these cases, um, it's sort of suggested that uh, a one in 10 rule applies in terms of um, one predictor for every 10 data points so that the model doesn't overfit to that sample. So this is where machine learning can come in. So certain models uh, or methods such as decision trees can really deal well with this issue of multiclinarity. And they also don't have to be linear. Um, and they also can be uh, sort of evaluated on out of sample data so that they are objectively tested for whether they overfit or not. So this is what the data looks like. Um, we have a dependent variable, uh, which is 70 um, prevalence estimates um, of a uh, country level. And that's been collected from the Gallup World Poll. So this data includes 45 um, countries, so unique countries. So there's either a prevalence estimate in 2016, one in 2018, or there's uh, one in both for each country. The independent variables um, were scraped from open source data. So there was a large number of them, uh, so 107 in total. Uh, and this included uh, information from other sustainable development goals, so other indicators. And the challenge, of course, of this that many people have working with uh, sustainable development goal um, data is that, of course, we have this small n large p. And the issue with this really is that it can lead to unstable insights and issues with multiclinearity. So we've taken steps in our methodology to deal with this in a way which traditional regression approaches can't or don't. So I'll talk you through quickly the methodology. So first of all, we test the utility of compressing down this 107 variable feature space into a, a much smaller number of components. And we test this um, compared to feature selection using theory based on the literature. We then um, also evaluate the performance of multiple different interpretable uh, machine learning models. As I mentioned, regressions, decision trees, and random forest. And they're selected because uh, you can extract the level of importance of each predictor in that model. So they, they, you can actually look and understand what is going on within the model, what variables are important predictors, which is really what the key of this is. It isn't pure prediction. We're looking to use these prediction models to get a better idea of the sort of complex explanations which might occur for modern day slavery. So the, the evaluation was done using threefold uh, cross-validation, which involves uh, leaving some data out so that we can test whether the model generalizes. We then moved on to, once we'd selected our best model category, uh, leave one out analysis. And this was to ensure that when we then fit the model to the entire data set to get an explanation, that this explanation was stable and representative of the whole sample. So using the leave one out analysis, we selected the optimal parameters for our model. Then to sort of test for the stability of the explanation, we used a Rashomon set, which I'll talk in more detail about later, to try and understand whether the interpretation we're getting from our best performing model um, is similar uh, to other well-performing models or whether it's a diverging um, interpretation. And this is important because in machine learning, multiple models can give similar or the same uh, sort of performance, but could, could be completely, uh, could give completely different explanations. And we're really 
interest in the explanation. So you want to know whether this explanation is stable. And then finally, we use um, ICE, so ind individual conditional expectation curves, to identify subgroups and threshold effects. So these are the so 12 different uh, broad model categories uh, or classes which we um, went through. So I'll just explain a little bit more. So the first common is whether the model had feature selection. So what this means is that from the 107 possible features, um, we selected 35 based on the previous literature um, alone. So we're kind of using here um, in these uh, bottom six models, a sort of balance between data-driven and theory-driven modeling. So these were compared and then in addition we also looked to see whether within that feature pool um, of either 107 or 35 whether um, a further feature compression was useful or not. So for this we used non-negative matrix factorization which is useful because again um, it's highly interpretable or we use no compression at all. So all the variables get input at once. Then the different model classes we used included, as I mentioned, a linear regression model um, compared to two different uh, non-linear approaches. So this is decision trees and random forests. So I won't have too much time um, to go into this, but decision trees and random forests, essentially the advantage of them is that they're non-linear and that also you can, it allows the variables to sort of interact in a non-linear manner as well. So the best model, um, and we tested it for, here we've got mean absolute error, we also tested for root mean square error and var variance explained. And the best model uh, was the same for all three metrics. And as you can see here, so we have all features on this side versus theory selected features on the right. And the best model uh, was the non-negative matrix factorization, um, so the compression down to five features, and then we input those features into a decision tree. Um, so it's interesting that um, this model performed best on both sets of data or pools, but actually there's obviously some discovery going on in the all feature. There's something uh, that we haven't found um, that's predictive. Um, in the all features uh, feature pool compared to what we just already know from the literature alone. Here is the best prediction model uh, again explained. So the non-negative non matrix factorization, it just breaks down the two, uh, the, the uh, pool, the feature space into two different matrices, which when multiplied together um, equal the original data plus some um, additional reconstruction error. We then take the H matrix, which is the five different components, which the original feature space has been reduced down to, and input those, as I mentioned, into um, a regression tree. So once we'd found this best model, um, we then performed leave one out analysis, because we actually found that using threefold cross-validation on such a small data set, um, did not provide stable enough interpretation. So we found that the model um, was fitting differently for each of the three folds. So when we did this, the model performed, um, it was slightly worse than what we had with uh, cross-fold validation, which was 0 0.19, but it's still uh, 0 0.327, um, uh, it's still a lot better than the mean baseline, as you can see. So it looks like we have a pretty decent model and considering how many, you know, having to train this model on just 70 data points, um, we are pretty happy uh, with this improvement. But interesting, as you can see, uh, when we plot in blue, the model performance compared to in orange, the actual um, prevalence of slavery as a percentage of the population. Um, so in blue, sorry, is the prediction. As you can see, the model is, is doing fairly okay on the sort of middle ground um, predictions, but as soon as there's an outlier, um, so when the prevalence is much higher, our model generally uh, can't capture that, it underestimates that. So this is the components uh, interpretation. So the NMF produced these five 
um, different components in which all the variables loaded onto. So here I've just printed off the top 10 uh, loading um, variables um, and I've given them some uh, sort of rough interpretation um, for now uh, in terms of what those variables represent. And some of these variables you can also add components, I should say, or they're often as well called bases uh, in NMF literature. Um, so what these components um, capture um, is this armed conflict, which we've already seen uh, in the literature, is very predictive of slavery. Um, it also captures sort of this basic needs, or you could say poverty um, element. Um, and, but it also draws out these other interesting, more socio-political um, components. So here we have um, social inequality, uh, religious and political freedoms, and undemocratic minority rule. And these components then got input into this decision tree model. Uh, so I won't go into too many detail, but as you can see, it's still a fairly simple um, and interpretable model. So we can look now at the different interactions which occur. So the main, I guess, insight um, from using this model is looking at the importance so we have these five components, but now which of these did the model use to get the best predictions? So as you can see on this graph here, the most important variable or predictive variable in the model was this social inequality variable, followed closely by religious and political freedom, then the sort of undemocratic or oppressive minority rule. So interestingly, all three of these perform better than the sort of well-established predictors already in the literature, such as armed conflict and basic, and human, basic needs and human rights. So interestingly, what is it about this social, dist, uh, sorry, this uh, social inequality variable? Because it hasn't really massively been studied in the literature. Um, of course, we know that sort of vulnerable populations um, might be ethnic minority. We also know that women um, are more sort of targeted for slavery, particularly in terms of ex sexual exploitation. Um, so what did, the, what did these two variables mean? How can we interpret them? So as you can see, it's the majority of these two uh, top variables here. So the social power distribution um, is about how groups in society, such as immigrants or different ethnicities and religions, are treated. Um, and that's really important because, as I mentioned, these are our vulnerable populations. And the second variable, the physical, physical security of females, is about how well women are protected by law and enforcement on matters such as domestic violence, rape, marital rape, um, sexual assault, and even honour killings. So that is something which really has been sort of drawn out by this analysis um, and being able to compare these more socially constructed components um, to things like poverty and um, armed conflict. But as I mentioned, what's good about decision trees is that they can identify subgroups and thresholds and perhaps interactions between the different components as well, which again, you just don't get in a typical sort of regression model. So here we're using these um, ICE curves, um, which is very much uh, very similar to um, a partial dependency plot, except it shows how each country's prediction changes when the feature changes. So the partial dependency plot line is this black line here, which is the mean, and on each other colour is an individual country. And these can be really useful for identifying um, not just uh, non-linearities in the data, but also um, interactions. So for some countries, um, some variables might have the opposite effect. There might be a diverging um, effect. And what this shows here um, is that two countries uh, have a much lower uh, sort of threshold in which social inequality affects predicted prevalence. Um, and here you can see that it's fairly neutral until it gets to severe inequality and it shoots up. But actually for the, this two data points, which is actually 
um, for the same country, Cambodia, in 2016 and 2018, there's a, there's a different threshold. And practically, these um, thresholds are really important to identify um, when so doing applied research, because, for example, if you want to try and um, increase, let's say, literacy, um, we need to know whether it actually makes a difference to continue, for example, until the age of 14 or continue schooling until the age of 16, because then we can better use the resources. And it's important to also note that this might not be the same um, in every different country. So I mentioned the sort of stability over different solutions as well. Um, and this is done by looking at defining a Rashman set. Because we want to know, do other well-performing models give a similar or diverging solution um, an explanation? So a Rashman set is a group of similar performing models which can be analysed to see whether alternative or opposing um, almost or equally as good explanations exist. Um, and this is really important because we want to, we have the best model that we found, but we want to know whether these insights are sort of stable, whether there's this alternative explanation. So I've just chosen uh, 10 different models here to visually um, identify, and this is the mean absolute error on the side. So here we can see this is our best performing model. There's two other models which come fairly close, but still not quite as good, but fairly close in performance. And then there's a big gap here. So for now, we're just taking these uh, three models as the Rashman set. Within this Rashman set, we want to find out whether there is similarity in terms of the solution and the explanation of these models. So to start with, um, as we look down the bottom, again, this is just the predictions of the different models compared to the actual in blue. And as you can see, all three models seem to sort of struggle on the same data points. So in this case, they're underestimating the large amounts um, or la large levels of prevalence. And this is, uh, we discussed the matter of well, in a more applied domain, and perhaps maybe on the next iteration of this analysis, we would try um, and weight um, the countries with higher prevalence greater, so that actually we're better at predicting the countries uh, where sort of slavery is higher, because these are the ones which perhaps we need to sort of address more. But for now, we're just keeping them um, equally weighted. So here we can see that they also sort of struggle on the similar types of countries. And then this graph shows the different importance weightings given to the different components. And again, you can see that there is a similarity between the components that are most important. So for social inequality, um, the both models one and two um, rate it as highly important. For uh, religious and political freedoms, all of the um, variable, all of the models um, ranked that as highly important. And so you can see that there is some similarity here in terms of how the decision tree is using these components. And indeed, the model selected all of the same five components. So that was completely stable. So to summarise, this really in this domain um, of Monday slavery is the first statistical comparison of a large number of variables and generally using regression approaches that this is very um, hard to do but because of the machine learning um, approaches we've been able to address the issues of model instability, multicollinearity um, and also stability of the explanation through using th uh, tools such as the leave one out analysis, um, the Rashman uh, set. And that's really sort of allowed us to draw out these additional insights. Um, so for example, the discovery, uh, sort of the inductive method um, of being able to sort of find out these new things, which such as social inequality, which may have been overlooked um, in the literature. And we can also identify these sort of threshold effects and the complexities which occur in the real world where there are countries which behave different to other countries. So not one country is going to be affected the same way 
um, by the same variables. And that's important to note in our analysis of slavery as well. So thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference.